What you're about to read is a living story, true in every sense, of a man named Ananias who believed in a man named Saul, and the rest is our New Testament. Two-thirds of the book we call the New Testament, he wrote. And it all came down to that one moment when he stood in the presence of Ananias. Now, we've got three places you can read the conversion of Paul, okay? One is in Acts 9. That's the historical narrative section. Then Acts 22 is when Paul is telling his story, and that's when he's in front of the temple authorities. Then Acts 26, he's in front of Agrippa, and he is relating his story of his conversion. We're going to use the first two, 9 and 22, because that's where Ananias occurs. He does not occur anywhere else in Scripture. So the only place you meet this man is in Acts 9 and Acts 22. So get a Bible, and I apologize. We're going to kind of be back and forth, but it takes both to get the full dimension of this incredible servant who was ordinary ever since but had extraordinary impact. Now, let me set up what we're going to read. Paul was named Saul at the time. He was a persecutor. He's the one that held the cloaks. He held the garments of those who stoned Stephen to death. So as a young man, he watches this servant named Stephen die for the gospel. And there was something in Saul that said, I'm going to do God a favor and I'm going to kill every Christian I can. So he became a persecutor of the church. He studied under the best rabbis. In fact, in Philippians 3, when he tells his story, he said, I was of of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm I'm a a Jew's Jew every sense of the word. I was righteous according to the law. I knew the law, and I lived the law. So Saul thought he was doing God a favor. And on that day, he got on a horse and began to ride from Jerusalem to Damascus. Now, Damascus is in Syria. If you've ever been to Israel, usually the tour guides will take you up to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Then they'll take you up to what is called the Golan Heights. From the Golan Heights, you can actually look and see Syria. And I remember the first time I was there, the guide was talking about, as we're looking down at Syria, he was talking about how Israel knows how many planes Syria has in the air all the time. And so it was just kind of a a, a little speech about military power and prowess and all. But I kept looking the distance at a city because I had been told that Damascus was there. I asked the God, is that Damascus? He said, you can barely see it. It's on the horizon there. And all I could think about what it must have been like that day when a man named Saul got on his horse. He had letters to go and arrest more Christians, and he's headed to that city known as Damascus. And all of a sudden, he sees something. And there is this incredible bright light, and it's so bright, it knocks him to his knees. I mean, he hits the ground. It blinds him. And there's this voice from that light that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then it gives him instruction. And you know who that voice was? It was none other than Jesus Christ, the living Lord. The very one he sought to stop. Now, here's what is amazing to me. Saul thought he was right. Saul had the law. Saul had the best teaching in the world. But it took a vision of the living Lord to change his world forever. Now, guys, I love different ways of evangelism. I love EE. I love uh, Steps to Peace with God, Billy Graham's. I love what Campus Crusade Bill did many years ago with four spiritual laws. But let me tell you something. There is only one thing that changes a man's life forever, and that is when Jesus shows up. And something happens that he never forgets. It is a supernatural moment. And so here is Saul. He's blinded now. This powerful man is being led to a house on a street called Straight. Meanwhile, God is speaking to an ordinary servant named Ananias. And that's where we pick up the story. I'm reading, first of all, Acts 9, verse 10. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, Rise, go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. 
For behold, he's praying. And he's seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, this is funny, but true for every one of us. Lord, I've heard of that man. And how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. He's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the, for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed. He entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Now turn to Acts 22. Same story. This time Paul is telling it. It's not Luke recounting the narrative that is historical narrative. It's actually Paul standing and talking to the temple authorities. Watch the way he tells it. I'm reading verse 12, 22. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, was well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and I saw him. And this man, Ananias, said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. And you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and what you have heard. And why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Who in the world is this guy, Ananias? We don't know much about him. We believe he might have been a Jew living in Jerusalem when he became a follower of Christ at Pentecost. Possibly he moved to Damascus. You know why? Because of the persecution of a man named Saul. And so now he's living in Damascus, living out a life of obedience to Christ. And so what was it that made this ordinary servant so usable of God? I've just kind of put some handles on it to give you something to grab hold of. Number one, he walked intimately with Christ. He walked intimately with Christ. When you read the version in chapter 22, it says he was a devout man. That is not a common term in the New Testament. That's really not a common term. It, it only occurs 10 times. So there must be something about him that the Bible would call him a devout man. When you take the word devout and when you begin to peel back the surface and you get into the etymology of that word, you know what it really basically at the core means? A man who stood in awe of God. A man who stood in awe of God. I think that's a great place for ordinary servants to start, is to basically stand in awe of God, which means I fear you more than I fear anything else. I hear you better than I hear anyone else. He listened to God. He listened. He talked with God. So here is a man who walked intimately with Christ. The second thing, he lived openly before God and before others. He lived openly before God and others. Now, you notice when I read in, in the ninth chapter, go back to that chapter, there is this moment after he is told about Saul and how he's supposed to go and lay hands and do what he had to do. Verse 13 says, but Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard about this man. Now, guys, how many of you in this room would struggle with going to an enemy in your neighborhood? an enemy of the church. For example, let's say that you get word that somebody who's moved in your neighborhood that is an atheist and has been very violent toward Christians. What if one morning when you're reading your devotionals, God said to you, go take a loaf of banana nut bread. You gonna walk down there and show up? I can tell you there was a struggle in Ananias. And this struggle was, but Lord, I've heard about this guy. He persecutes the church. You know what the word is that's used for persecute? You've heard me use this word. It's the word dioko. 
Paul later uses it about his pursuit of Christ. But here it's used about the pursuit of Christians. It is a hunting term. Seriously, it's a hunting term. That's why I hunt, because it's so biblical. It's the words in the Scripture. <laughs> it's a hunting term. It means to hunt down something just like a predator hunts the prey. Except in this, t- in this case, the Christian is the prey. Who's the predator? Saul. So you can see why he struggled. And he lived the kind of life that was openly saying, God, I, I, I just, this is a guy that we all fear. He's here to arrest us. But he did what he heard, and he overcame that fear. You know what else he did? He lived openly among people. There's something about Ananias that amazes me, and that is in chapter 22, it says not only was he devout, But he was well spoken of by all the Jews. Now, guys, when it says all the Jews, it's not talking about believing Jews. It's talking about those that he used to be like them, but he became a follower of Christ. So, in other words, even those that could have done him harm because they differed so much on who Jesus was, he was well spoken of by the Jews. Let me tell you a concern I have about the church today. The American church somewhere heard along the way that the more enemies you have, the more godly you are. I don't know where we heard that because it is not from Jesus. Now, Jesus warned us, and he said the world is going to hate us. But I see, in, I see in Ananias a different picture. I see a man that was well spoken of even by those who did not agree. This week, We had on our campus the imam who is over the 14 mosque of Central Florida. He came to a meeting that several of us were involved in. We had a rabbi, we had pastors, we had priests. And it was a meeting basically about what do we do about homelessness? How do we make a difference in this place? And and, and they're so complimentary of the work that you're doing and we're doing as a church. And they met here in Faith Hall. So at the end of the meeting, I went over to the imam and I said, is this the first time? I think I knew the answer before I asked, but I said, is this the first time you've come to First Baptist? And he said, yes, it is. First time I've been on campus. And I said, well, I want you to know something. I think I speak for all of us. You're welcome here. And we hope you've had a great visit. And by the way, you're welcome anytime. And we have some events that I'd love to invite you to. We have a thing called the Singing Christmas Trees. It's a big production for Christmas. And Man, I'd love for you to come and be my guest there. He was so gracious. Thanked me. As he walked out, I said, hey, if you need help, just let me know getting out of here because you can get lost. And he laughed. He said, I got lost coming in. I may get lost. I said, that's okay. You talk to anybody here, they'll help you. And when he left, here's the question I had. How well spoken of will we be from this man? In other words, what will he say about his visit to this place? For Ananias, he was well spoken of. So it shows you a little bit of glimpse into the heart and the life of this man. He lived openly before God, even before man. Third thing, he was obedient. This may be the most challenging part of who he was. He was obedient. The very first thing you read when you're reading Acts chapter 9 Verse 10, there was a disciple named in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. What a great answer when God calls your name. This guy was just one that said, Yes, Lord, I'm here. Now, I'm going to read into that just a little bit. I think he was saying, Yes, Lord, what are we going to do today? What do you have for me today? Now, I know he struggled with what God had, but isn't it cool he accepted an assignment before he even knew what it was? I love people that just say, yes, Lord, what are we doing today? I'm ready to go. Did you know I believe it is the number one ingredient to be used of God mightily is to have availability in your heart. Just to say, I'm here. What do you need, Lord? What are we doing today? And you know, that sounds just like other places in the Scripture. Remember Isaiah? Isaiah 6, he says he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And and after this incredible interchange of his feeling unworthy, and then the seraphim flying down, taking a coal off the altar, touching his lips and saying, you're cleansed. Then he hears God saying, who will go for us? 
Who will I send or who will we send? And this is what Isaiah said. Here am I. Send me. What a beautiful picture of a servant God can use. I think that's what makes ordinary extraordinary. It's just somebody that's messed up, marred, broken, saying, Lord, I'm here. What do you want? I can tell you about another man named Moses. Moses, remember, stood at a burning bush. Bush was burning. All of a sudden, a voice came from the bush saying, hey, I got a plan, Moses. My people are down in Egypt. I've heard their cry. I want you to be the deliverer. I want you to go lead them out. I'm going to do incredible works. All you got to do is show up. I'll do the rest. And when are we going? Let's go. And you remember what Moses said? Moses looked up and said, here, my Lord, send him. And he pointed to Aaron. He said, Aaron is a lot better at this. He really is. He can speak. I'm, I stutter. But Aaron is the guy you want. What audacity to say that. How many times have we said, Lord, here I am, but I think I know somebody would be great for this. You, you really ought to talk to them. Actually, in the King James, you know what Moses said? He looked up and he said, Lord, send whomever thou wilt. That's King James. Listen to that. Lord, send whomever thou wilt. Isn't it great? Don't you know God laughs when we use religion and we use all the religious phrases and we kind of act so pious and so, oh, Lord, send whomever thou wilt. And God's going, thou wilt, you go. <laughs> and yet Moses, oh, no, no, look, there's somebody else. Not Ananias. Ananias said, I'm here, Lord. What are we doing? He was obedient. And then I had to cite, I think the phrase he entered the house is incredible. Let me tell you why I think that is. Judas, we don't know who Judas was, but it's not the Judas of the, new, the uh, earlier Judas, okay? It's not the betrayer because he died. There was a house where Judas lived, and that's where Saul was, praying. Ananias is told to go down the street called what? Straight. You know why that street was called straight? Because it was straight. I'm just teaching. I'm, I'm trying to help. It is actually a street that is a three-mile street through Damascus, and there is still to this day, not called straight, it's called a Syrian name, but it is called straight in the Bible because it was a straight thoroughfare, the main one running east to west, and we believe that Ananias had to walk a large three miles had to walk a long way down that street. And so what amazes me is as he's walking down that street, how do you think he was feeling? Because he's about to get to the house of a man who, it, for all rights and purposes, is out to kill him. And the Bible says he entered the house. You know what I would have done? I would have stood on the porch. Hey, Saul, I'm out here. I'm thinking if I got an option of running... I'm in much better shape. I remember going in a house. When the door opened, knocked on the door, the door opened. There were two Dobermans, I promise you. They were looking over this screen door that had wood part of the way and then screen. They were standing and looking over the wood. They were huge. And then the girl comes to the door, opens the door, says, come on in. And then I look up and she has a python wrapped around her. So in this moment, I'm thinking... You know what? I'm doing great out here. Let me just stand down here and talk. <laughs> I just think Ananias, when he entered the house, was like saying what Esther said when she went to the king on behalf of the Jews. If I perish, I perish. I'm going to do what God said. And he went in the house. Now, the last thing about Ananias, he had compassion. What this man does when he walks in the house is amazing. Go back to the text. I'm in chapter 9. I'm now in verse 17. Ananias departed, entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. The first thing you got to notice is he touched Saul. He laid hands on him. Now, remember, Saul's blind. So he, he's not seeing anything. He's hearing, but he's not seeing anything. And the first thing Ananias does is he walks in and lays his hand on him. Now, I know for us the laying on of hands is different. But in this culture, 
when you touch someone, that's huge. Go back sometime and look in the New Testament at how many times touch is involved. I mean, touch is a critical piece of, of the story of Christ and the gospel. And, and it's almost as if when he walked in and laid hands on Ananias, it was a way of saying, I believe in you. Now, I don't know if he laid his hand on his head. I don't know if he laid his hand on his shoulder. I don't know. But I'm telling you, he had compassion for this man named Saul because he touched him. When you read what Paul later writes, I believe it means the world to him that he touched him because what did he say we're to do? Greet one another with a holy wave. How y'all doing? Good to see you today. No, with a holy kiss. We live in a culture that unfortunately touch has been sensualized and it's been perverted and corrupted. But I promise you in the New Testament, you will be shocked at how many times Jesus laid his hands on somebody. He could have spoken the word. He could have stood at a distance and say, Lord bless you. But he didn't. He touched him. And I just think that touch said, Saul, I don't even know much about you, but I believe that God is changing your life. I remember the day that I first met an AIDS victim. It was many years ago. It was back in the 80s. Family in our church called me and said, Pastor, we're so embarrassed, but our son has contracted AIDS and he's dying. And we just can't bear the thought of him dying without someone praying for him and talking to him. And would you go and talk with him? I said, I will. I'd be glad to. Sit in a pastor. And I remember them telling me this specifically. You, listen, he contracted AIDS through the homosexual lifestyle. And we understand uh, how you feel about that. You, pastor, you don't have to go in the room. If you just walk up to the door and, and speak to him through the door. I said, I will not do that. I get to the hospital. I walked up to the door, stopped for a moment. And the Lord Jesus said, do what I would do. I walked in that room. I'll never forget him. He was a shell of a man. I mean, he was as thin as could be, and he had an oxygen mask. He was within days of dying. And he looks up to me, and he goes, Pastor, you came. I said, sure I did. Your mom and dad love you. And more than that, Jesus loves you. And so I began to talk with him about faith, and he assured me that he had come to know Christ as a young man, and he still had his faith, and he still believed in the Lord Jesus. He had made choices that he knew now disappointed God and were contrary to God's word. But he said, Pastor, I know now, and I understand, and I just know I'm ready, and I have a peace. I said, man, that is awesome. And it came for that moment when I was going to leave. And if you've ever prayed with me, this most natural thing for me to do is if I'm praying for you and I'm going to walk over and I'm going to hold your hand or I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder. So I'm thinking there for a moment, I don't need to touch him. This is the 80s. This is when we didn't know much about AIDS. We didn't know how it spread. And I mean, we were really struggling with that, with that epidemic. And so I remember thinking, man, I can't touch him. And then the Lord spoke and said, do what I would do. And I'll never forget reaching down and as I started to reach, this is what he said, Pastor, you don't have to do this. And I said, yes, I do. I'm a follower of Jesus. It's what he would do. And I remember reaching down and holding him and praying over him. His family never forgot that. That man died two days later. His family never forgot that. And neither will I. Because of touch. When I was at a deacon's meeting the other night, or at another meeting, but the deacons were there, Mike Kelsey that prayed a minute ago, he said, Pastor, come up here. We want to pray for you. We just want you to know we love you. We want to support you. Come up here. And I walked up there, and he said, hold your hands out. And I'm standing in front of all these committees, and I've got my arms out like an idiot. I'm like, what, what are we doing here? Give me some help. I'm an airplane. I'm going to fly. I believe I can fly. That's the song. But I didn't break into song. Anyway, I'm standing here. And he says, you guys come and stand under pastor's arms. Lift his arms. And I'm telling you, the most amazing thing happened. Everybody in that room got under my arms. Most of them could walk under it without any problem. But everybody <laughs> got under my arms and started lifting. He said, pastor, relax. And there was one, and I don't know who it was, 
grabbed my little finger. I felt it. And there was something really incredible in that moment as I felt the hands of the leaders of this church praying for their pastor. So when I think about him walking in that room and touching this guy, that's huge. It's compassion. And not only did he touch him, what did he call him? Brother. Now, this is before Saul is baptized. This is before he has heard anything about Saul's testimony. I mean, he calls him brother as if to say, you are my brother. Did you know that that word, 75% of the times in the New Testament when the word brother is used, it's not blood kin, it's talking about spiritual kin. 256 times it's used for brothers in Christ. So he basically looks at him and calls him a brother in Christ. He didn't stand back and say, well, I'll call you brother when you prove it. Or I know you and I know how these conversions go and sometimes you don't really mean it, so I'm going to wait until you show me that you really mean it. You don't hear any of that. He just walks in and calls him brother. Let me just tell you something. To walk in and affirm somebody in the Lord takes God. To criticize takes no God. It's easy to criticize people. It's easy to stand back and judge. It's easy to stand back and find things that they're doing wrong or find things that are wrong. Listen, that's real easy. That doesn't take any God. It takes a lot of God to walk into a man like Saul and call him brother. But he did it. Why? Because he believed it. It's like saying, I believe in you. I believe what God is doing in you. And he blessed him. The scripture says he blessed him. And it's interesting, the very thing in chapter 22, verse 14, this is what Ananias told Saul. The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. What is interesting is that the blessing that Ananias gave Saul lined up perfectly with what Jesus said to Saul on the road to Damascus. Have you ever considered that when you were prompted or prompted to bless somebody? Now, I don't mean bless them out. That's a whole different story. Bless them? Have you ever considered the fact that it may be God wanting to confirm what he's already been saying to them? Because sometimes when God speaks to us, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to believe it. But when somebody else comes along and speaks the same thing, it's like a truth is confirmed by two witnesses according to the Scripture. So if you are prompted to say something to somebody before you leave today, don't miss it. Because it might be God's already talking to that person, and he wants you simply to confirm what God's already said. That's what he did. He confirmed what Jesus had already said to him. The last thing, he baptized him. He baptized him. How cool is that? And by the way, that reference in chapter 22, and I just must say this quickly in passing, it looks like he was baptized to wash away his sins, but that is an aorist participle. And pardon the grammar, but it really makes a difference in your theology if you know the aorist. The aorist is a past tense, and the participle is something that has happened before. So basically, he was baptized not to wash away his sins. He was baptized because his sins had already been washed away. You see, Saul was saved the moment he called on Jesus. The baptism was just simply the evidence of what had already happened. And Ananias stood there and baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no greater compassion than to be there for somebody in that moment, to stand with them. So this is Ananias. This is the ordinary servant. So what's the extraordinary impact? Remember last week we broke it down, ordinary servant, extraordinary impact? You know what the extraordinary impact? I'll give you one. Paul. That's it. That's the impact. Paul. Two-thirds of the New Testament written by him or about him. Do you know how many miles he traveled to share the gospel? 13,400 miles. He traveled. And by the way, he didn't use frequent flyer miles. Nope. Got on a horse, got on a donkey, walked. Why would this man go 13,400 miles for the gospel to the known world? That's the impact of Ananias 
doing what God told him to do in the life of one named Saul. You know what I believe? You need to be an Ananias. You need to be just like that priest was to Jean Valjean. You need to be somebody who speaks blessing and steps in the life of somebody to confirm what God is doing in their life. I'll give an example. Tritonius was a German schoolmaster. He would come into his eighth grade boys and he would bow to them. Well, these eighth grade boys, they were like, what's he doing? And one of them asked one day, why do you bow to us? Tritonius said, because one day God is going to use you mightily and I won't be there to honor the work of God in you. You know who one of those eighth grade boys was? Martin Luther. One man bowing. It's amazing. How about this? You ever heard of Billy Graham? Everybody knows Billy Graham. You ever heard of a guy named Albert McMakin? Mm -mm. You should. Billy Graham, as a 16-year-old, went to a youth group, and the youth group told him he was too worldly. He couldn't come back. Turned him away. True story. He goes back to the Graham farm where he grew up, and there was a farm worker named Albert McMakin, a farm worker, who looked at him and said, Billy, don't give up on the church. Don't give up on God. You ought to try again. There's a preacher in town tonight named Mordecai Ham. You ought to go hear this preacher named Mordecai Ham. Billy goes to hear that preacher, gives his life to Christ, and the rest is history. All because a farm worker, ordinary servant, extraordinary impact.